Hi. This video is uh, going to be a bit of a, a journey, a mathematical journey. And I, I like to put this, this is something I put together a few years ago for, for this course, the Calculus and Vectors course, um, because it takes a number of the ideas in this course, and, and, and even some ideas from both the vectors and from the calculus, and kind of connects them together. None of the stuff in this video, I want to make sure this is clear, is going to be expected of you or tested on the final exam or anything like that. It's all extension material. But I like the way it kind of connects these diverse ideas together. It also connects them together in a very eloquent, and some would say beautiful formula that comes up at the end of it. Um, that, there, you know, people would widely acknowledge as the most beautiful formula that exists in mathematics. And, uh, in fact, there have been people in the past that have used the sheer eloquence of this formula as evidence to the existence of a creator. I'll have to leave that for you to decide. Um, but uh, that argument has definitely been made. And what's nice is it starts in pretty familiar territory, solving quadratic equations. Okay? So here I have a quadratic equation, x squared plus 2x plus 2, and I want to solve it. So the first thing you would probably want to do is try to factor it, and it will not take you very long to realize you cannot factor that. So the next logical thing to do is to pull out the quadratic formula. There it is right there. Substitute in your values for a, b, and c. Simplify it, and you end up with this. And the thing to note, of course, is the negative 4 under the square root sign. And what most students would do at this stage is they would go, wow, I can't take the square root of a negative number. That has no solution, so there's no roots. There's, there's no solution to this particular equation, and they'd be done. And, and, and in a way, they're right, but there is a way to solve this equation. The thing is, we can't use the types of numbers that you've looked at so far, these numbers being the real numbers. This equation has no solution in the real numbers. But can we create or discover, different people would use different terms here, a type of number that would allow us to express this solution. Let's see what we can do. There is a type of number that can be used. It's called an imaginary number. Okay. And the term imaginary number was first given to these numbers by, by René Descartes. You might know him from the, he's the think therefore I am guy. And he was actually using it as a derogatory way of representing these numbers because a lot of, they, they've been uh, talked about sort of on the, outskirts of mathematics for, for centuries and centuries, but nobody particularly liked the idea. Okay? But it was an Italian mathematician in 1545 by the name of Cordano who ended up using this in a practical way. He was solving equations not too dissimilar from the equation that we just had. And he recognized that these equations, first of all, people hadn't been able to solve them before, but he could solve them if he used these, uh, this idea of an imaginary number as an intermediate step, the solutions he were getting were real numbers, but he had to have this intermediate step, so he was using it to get something that he wanted. He didn't like the idea, but he didn't have any other way to do it. Today we would represent this number with the symbol i. Okay? And if we're going to introduce a number, we're going to have to give it some properties to define it. Okay? Other than the properties you would normally associate with numbers that you are very, very familiar with, i actually only has one new property. And that property is that when you square it, you're going to get negative 1. And this is usually the part where people go, wait a second, what, what, the heck, what are you even thinking about? How can I square something and get negative 1? I can't even picture what that number would be like. Well, I guess that's why it's called an imaginary number. And people don't like the idea. They think you're, you're doing something fishy, but the truth is you've done this kind of thing before. If you go to a primary age student, say a grade 1 student, and you ask him, what's 3 minus 5, or her, they'll almost surely look at you and say, you can't do that. How can you take away 5 from 3? How can you take away more than what you have? And the truth is, mathematicians would commonly think exactly the same way. Right up until the 18th century, lots of mathematicians would have given you the same answer. You can't take away 5 from 3. Of course, you do this all the time. You got introduced to the idea of a negative number quite some years ago, and you would know that negative, or 3 minus 5 is negative 2. Not a problem. But think about that number negative 2. Is it a physical number? Can you picture what negative 2 is like? I'm not talking about picturing it on a number line or anything. I mean physically. Can you hold negative 2 apples in your hand? And of course you can't. So it's an abstract idea. 
that doesn't mean it has applications. It has lots of applications. You've run into tons of applications of negative numbers. But the idea itself is abstract, and it takes a bit to get used to. Once you're used to it, you'll use it just like you use any other kind of a number. And this idea of an imaginary number, it's the same idea. At first, it seemed kind of strange. I can't picture it. Well, there are ways of kind of representing this abstract idea that we'll run into. But the truth is, if you're going to accept negative numbers, there's no reason why you can't accept imaginary numbers. And just like negative numbers have all kinds of applications, imaginary numbers do as well. Okay. And one of those applications is going to allow us to solve our formula here. Okay? Because if i squared is equal to negative 1, I can take the negative in the negative 4 and replace it with an i squared. And then from here on in, I just use my regular rules for algebra. I take the square root, I divide both terms in the numerator by 2, and end up with negative 1 plus or minus this i number. Even though I can't really picture that at this stage, I can demonstrate that that is a valid solution. Because I can go back to my original equation. Here's the expression that was on the left side of that equation. That's supposed to equal 0. So I'll substitute in one of my answers, negative 1 plus i. There I go. Substitute it in. Use my regular rules for algebra to expand out the brackets and collect like terms. I end up with i squared plus 1. But then I remember that singular property of i that makes it different from other types of numbers is that when I square it, it's negative 1. So I can replace the i squared with a negative 1. And of course, negative 1 plus 1 is 0. So negative 1 plus i is a solution. It's completely valid. I'll leave you to verify negative 1 minus 1 if you want to, but it works exact, pretty much the same deal. If you can do the negative 1 plus 1, you can do negative 1 minus 1. So this gives us a way of representing our solution. Okay. When I take a look at numbers like negative 1 plus i, we call these types of numbers complex numbers because they're made of two parts. There's a real part, the negative 1, and there's an imaginary part, the i. Okay? And in, a, in an effort to try and sort of visualize this uh, a little bit, what we can, one thing we can do is represent these as, ve as vectors. And the first person to do this was a, a surveyor, a Danish surveyor by the name of Caspar Vessel. He did this in 1799. And uh, we've been doing this, representing vectors on the Cartesian plane, except the two components, the negative 1 and the i, aren't an x and a y component. They're a real and imaginary component. So we have to change the axes. Instead of having an x and a y axis, we have a real axis, which would typically be the horizontal, and an imaginary axis. Okay? And so what I've done here is I, I drew a real axis and an imaginary axis, and I represented my two complex numbers as vectors, the negative 1 plus i and the negative 1 minus i. So negative 1 plus i would be negative 1 on the real axis and then positive i on the imaginary axis. And negative 1 minus i would be negative 1 on the real and negative 1, uh, or negative i, I'm sorry, on the uh, imaginary axis. Exactly the same idea back when we were working with vectors, except now instead of x and y, it's real and imaginary. It's the same idea. Okay. Well, what does this allow us to do? Well, we can now represent a vector by the sum of its two components, a, a complex number by the sum of its two components. So we have the, I'm going to let A represent the real component, and B is going, BI would be the imaginary component. Okay? But we know with vectors that there are two ways that we can represent them. We can represent them by their components. Again, previously we were doing that with X and Y. Here it's real and imaginary, but it's the same idea. But we can also represent vectors by their magnitude and direction. And we're going to use the letters, the variables r and theta to represent the magnitudes and direction. And what I've done here is just redrawn one of my vectors, where r represents the magnitude or the length of that vector, and theta represents the angle, which is going to be its direction. And the angle is measured from the positive real axis, just like all the way along, we've been measuring angles from the positive x-axis, so it's exactly the same idea. And of course, basic trigonometry gives us a relationship between the a and the b and the r and the theta. And I wrote those over here, that a would equal r times the cosine of theta, and b would equal r times the sine of theta. Um, I'll leave you to verify those, but if you think about that for a second, I'm sure you can convince yourself that that is true. So what I can do up here is I can take my uh, a plus bi, and I can replace the a with an r cosine theta, and the b with an r sine theta, end up with this. 
I can express it a tad more simply by simply taking the r out as a common factor, and I end up with r times the cosine of theta plus i times the sine of theta. And this way of representing a complex number is called the polar form of that number. It's all going to connect together, trust me, but I have to do a temporary diversion. Okay, and the temporary diversion is something we're going to call the Taylor, or not we, it is called the Taylor series. Taylor series was, uh, actually, a little bit of a history thing at the bottom, but we'll say for now that it was discovered in 1715 by an English mathematician by the name of Brooke Taylor. And here's the Taylor series, which looks really, really complicated, but it is actually extremely important. It's one of the most important formulas to really ever come out of mathematics. I'll explain why in a second. But one of the first things I want to point out is some of this should look familiar to you. Because earlier in the year we had an assignment on linear approximation. And what I want you to take a look at is the first two terms of the Taylor series right there. That is the linear approximation formula. So the Taylor series has quite a lot to do with linear approximation. In fact, it's very much the same idea, except we're not going to stop at the first derivative and how we can use the first derivatives to help us approximate a function. We're going to keep going and add terms that involve the second derivative and the third derivative and the dot, dot, dot would be with the fourth derivative and the fifth derivative and the sixth derivative. In fact, as long as we can keep taking derivatives of functions, we can keep adding more and more terms to the Taylor series and this approximation becomes more and more accurate. Back in the linear approximation assignment, I said that linear pro uh, your calculator does something like linear approximation in order to estimate things like, for instance, the square root of 13 and give you that decimal that you see. What it actually does is the Taylor series. The Taylor series is what your calculator does and what all calculators do and what all computers do in order to calculate functions like square roots and sines and cosines and logs and all these kinds of things. So it's an exceedingly important. You use it all the time without even knowing it. Okay. By the way, this little exclamation mark that you see here on the bottom, if you've taken the data management course, you've seen that lots. It's, a, it's called a factorial notation. So 3 with the exclamation mark is read as 3 factorial, and it means 3 times 2 times 1. So that would be 6. Okay. The next term in this dot, dot, dot would have a 4 factorial in the denominator, and 4 factorial means 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Okay, which is 24. And the next term would be 5 factorial, which is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is 120. So numbers get big pretty quickly. Okay. Anyway, let's use the Taylor series to represent a couple of familiar functions. So here down, we have the sine function and the cosine function represented as a Taylor series. And all you have to do is take first and second and whatever that, uh, I've actually gone up to the seventh derivative here. And then substitute in a number for the a. You make it simple, and we're going to let the a be a 0. And if you do that, I'll leave you to do the work. You end up with the series that you see here for sine. Sine is equal to x minus uh, x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the 5 over 5 factorial. Keep going like that. Cosine, there's a series for cosine done in exactly the same way. Okay, you can work it out yourself, or you can just trust me that that's what you get. All right, a little bit of a point of fact in the bottom is actually that a Scotsman by the name of Colin McLaurin uh, actually discovered what we call the Taylor series at pretty much around the same time. They discovered them simultaneously. But what uh, Brooke Taylor did is really explore the mathematics of this series, and especially the mathematics that leads up to this series, so to, to, to really rigidly kind of prove that this is actually a true relationship. And that's why the series is uh, more commonly referred to under his name. Okay. And in fact, the two trig relationships that I've highlighted down here were actually discovered in 14th century India, so centuries before this. Okay. It's the way math often works, is you get different people discovering different things at different times. All right. We've been talking about the number e and the function e to the x. And what the great mathematician Leonard Euler did, and this is in 1748, is he took the sale at Taylor series and used it on the function e to the x. It's actually an extraordinarily easy function to use the Taylor series on because, remember, you have to keep taking derivatives, but the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. So the first derivative of e to the x is e to the x, second derivative is e to the x, third derivative is e to the x. So it's really, really easy to apply the Taylor series to it. And if you do, you end up with the expansion that we have down here at the bottom. All right? Okay. This gave Euler a third way to represent complex numbers. We had our polar form, 
right here, r cos theta plus i times sine theta. And what I've done in the next line is replace the cosine theta with its Taylor series expansion and replace the sine theta with its Taylor series expansion and end up with something that looks pretty complicated but actually simplifies very quickly. I'm just going to go over this quick so people can sort of see where things go. So in this next line, what all I did was uh, exp multiply the i, expand out that inside set of brackets and end up with this. And then I reordered the terms in increasing power on the theta. And you end up with something that's kind of messy looking, right? And we want to try and simplify it. And the thing to notice, first of all, in the kind of messiness of it is, is there's the pattern in the negatives and positive signs. And we've got a plus, then two negatives, then two, pos uh, then two additions, then two subtractions, and it keeps kind of going like that. It'd be nice to make it all addition. Well, we can use our property of i, that i squared is equal to negative 1 to accomplish that. So, for instance, right here where I have a negative, if I want to get rid of that, I just got to remember, oh yeah, negative, that's an i squared. So I can change that to addition by introducing an i squared into that term. Remember again, i squared is negative 1. So this term right here, theta squared i squared over 2, is the same as negative theta squared over 2. These terms are equivalent to each other. And I can just keep doing that. So this negative I can replace by introducing an i squared into into that term, so I end up with that. And and the thing that you might begin to notice here is that the powers on the i are matching the powers on the theta so far. Right? We started off here with a theta to the 1 and an i to the 1. Here I have a theta squared and an i squared. Here I have a theta cubed and then i squared times another i would be an i cubed. It'd be nice to keep going with this, and we can. Even though the next term is positive, I can introduce an i squared squared. Why can I do that? Well, again, i squared is negative 1, and negative 1 squared is positive 1. So by introducing an i squared squared, all I'm introducing is multiplying by the number 1, which doesn't change anything at all. So I can do that. I can put an i squared squared in there anywhere I want. And now I got an i to the 4, which is the same as this, and I can just keep going with that. Here, I introduced an i squared squared into the term theta I, or theta to the 5i, and if you, you know, i squared squared is i to the 4 times another i would i to the 5, and that's the same power as the theta, and I can keep going with this as long, you know, indefinitely. So it turns out that the power on the i and the power on the theta are the same if I switch it all to addition. So I can express it this way. Instead of theta squared i squared, I can just write theta i squared, or theta i cubed, or whatever, all the way along. And then you might be noticing, hey, this is the expansion of e to the x, with theta i instead of the x. You can go back to the, look back in the video if you want to, but it is. Okay? So I can take that whole thing in brackets and simplify it down to e to the theta i. So it turns out that r cosine theta plus i sine theta is equal to r e to the theta i. And that formula is often referred to as Euler's formula. Okay. Here's where things get really remarkable. Okay. If I take Euler's formula and use it to represent the integer negative 1, we get something amazing. So over here I've drawn negative 1 on the on the what's called the complex plane on a real and imaginary axis. Negative 1 is a real number, so it would be at negative 1 on the real axis. The magnitude of that vector would be 1, so my r would be a 1. And my angle would be just pi, so my theta is a pi. So I just take r times e to the theta i, replace the r with a 1 and the theta with a pi. I end up with 1 times e pi i equals negative 1 which obviously simplifies to e pi i must be negative 1, and simply taking the negative 1 and adding it onto the left side, I end up with the equation here in the box. This is called Euler's equation. e to the pi i plus 1 equals 0. Might even look familiar. This is the equation that is considered to be the most beautiful equation in mathematics. And wh why is it considered so remarkable? One is that it's so simple. But the other thing is that it links together such important numbers in mathematics. You know, if we think about natural numbers, what's the most important number about a natural number? Well, it'd be the number one, because it's the first one. It helps to define what the natural numbers are. And the zero is an important number. Okay? And pi and e are important numbers. They come up all over the place. 
What's even more remarkable is to consider the fact that 0 and 1 are integers. And pi and e are irrational numbers. They can't even be expressed as fractions. Their decimals go on infinitely. Yet there's this simple relationship between them. And then you even, for a bonus, throw i into the mix, which isn't even a real number. It's an imaginary number. So these very different types of numbers, but very important numbers, all represented and, and, and connected together so eloquently in this very, very simple formula. And this formula has gotten sort of a pop culture, a kind of an iconic status. It's kind of like Einstein's e equals mc squared. You don't have to know anything about physics to have recognized e equals mc squared. And there are many people that know nothing about mathematics, yet they see e to the pi i plus 1 equals 0. They, they kind of seen that before. And just to sort of illustrate that, this is uh, an episode from uh, the Sim a Simpsons episode called Homer Cued, where Homer enters the third dimension, and they use some CGI to... Uh, to represent Homer going 3D here. And he's in this strange 3D world, and floating around him are all kinds of objects and equations. But you can see right here Euler's equation. Represent a little different. Put the 1 back on the right side, but it's the same equation. Okay? Actually, there's a couple of other equations that are in this episode as well. And uh, there's this one and this one, which I've represented down here at the bottom. Okay? And both of these are actually to be honest, little mathematical jokes, but uh, I don't want to spoil them. So what I'll do is, if, if you're interested in finding out what the joke is, or maybe you might even recognize what the joke is, uh, you know, I'll leave you to do some Googling and you can figure out what those are.